Uh, so I, um, as Guido say, I, I, I'm uh, uh, located at uh, in Glasgow, University of Glasgow, and this is our new building. And uh, the, the architects, when they ask her for what was our vision, is that we wanted to set the golden standard in uh, in virology. And so they took us literally, and we have this. <laughs> they came up with this uh, with this uh, gold. Uh, um, building that uh, took us by surprise because when they showed us the drawings, uh, it was a uh, old some sort of brown, brownish uh, um, uh, color, and uh, and so when we saw that, and they said, "But this is not what you showed us." We said, "Oh no, don't worry, they'll uh, oxidize because it's a copper alloy; it will oxidize with time." And they said, "So how long does it take? About ten or fifteen years." So that's <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if I'll ever see it um, uh, brown. Um, so today I will uh, um, I will focus on a fundamental question that is really a fundamental question in uh, in viral diseases in general. So it's how do arboviruses uh, evade the host uh, immune responses and how they actually cause disease? And, but I'm going to confess right away that I'm going to address this uh, fundamental question, uh, uh, this fundamental question um, talking about sheep. And I never put uh, sheep in the title because I, I learned with over the years that I, I lose all, half of the audience and I have to have a fight with the uh, editors of, of the journals if there, are, if, there are sheep, if there is sheep in the title. Uh, they lose immediately interest, so I always hide it. Um, and so I'll, spe I'll spend a couple of minutes of, uh, on trying to um, to convince you why uh, why I use sheep and why it's actually um, have a unique uh, um, um, a, a unique role in uh, in uh, uh, in trying to understand viral pathogenesis. So first of all, if we want to define what is it uh, viral pathogenesis, really is uh, is determined uh, by the complex virus host interaction. So this is the uh, viral replication in the presence either of beneficial or, or detrimental host responses. And that's how sort of viruses will cause uh, disease. So they have to replicate, and they have to replicate in the face of, uh, of the host immune responses. And of course, we all have uh, quite uh, well in, uh, ingrained in, uh, in our understanding that there are some viruses. Within the same virus, there are some viruses that will be more uh, um, uh, virulent than, uh, than, uh, than others. So you know, if we talk about influenza, there always these high virulent strains or low virulent strains. But really, any virus is always a sort of spectrum of, uh, of, uh, uh, of virulence. So any pathogenic virus will have a spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of virulence. And we also, the more we, uh, um, the more we sort of progress in our understanding of host genetics, we do know that the variability of the host also will uh, influence um, the, the, the pathogenic mechanism. So we'll have some, uh, uh, some of us that will be a bit more resistant than others uh, to, um, or more susceptible than others to the exactly the same, the same virus. So really that, just to sort of, the, when we want to understand how a virus causes disease, really you have to understand a variety of, uh, of, uh, of key factors. So the virus, as we say, has to replicate, and they will replicate in, media, in the face of uh, an innate immune response, so the immediate immune response, and they'll develop in a host adaptive uh, immunity. And really, this is part of, of both these processes. There'll be some of these responses that might be actually even detrimental. And the whole combination, all these factors, will cause viral pathogenesis. However, if we have, uh, if this is influenced by both the variability of the host genetics and the variability of the virus genetics, this is not doesn't happen in uh, in isolation, but it's something that uh, have, uh, that virus and hosts have co-evolved, and therefore they do have um, they play this sort of uh, of. Uh, um, uh, or seesaw where you, uh, uh, game where you really have a viral replication and the virus tends to sort of try to adapt to that particular host and uh, trying to evade the immune responses of the host. And at the same time, you have the host that uh, will try to be always uh, more uh, clever and uh, trying to make, uh, um, uh, try to contain 
uh, battery replication. So really this is uh, pathogenesis, therefore, is also influenced by virus host evolution. So now if this is true, then, therefore, we, when we want to study viral pathogenesis of a particular, so we want to understand how a particular virus causes disease, the best situation that we can put ourselves in actually study the natural host of that particular virus. So, of course, um, we can uh, um, understand the fundamental processes of, uh, of uh, host responses or even host uh, uh, of viral pathogenesis in, uh, in particular mo in uh, animal models in, in, in mice. But if you want to understand uh, how that particular virus causes disease and what is that determines the susceptibility to, uh, to virus infection. Ideally, we want to study that in the, in the natural host. And then this creates obvious complications, because if we want to study, then, of course, the, the studies of viral pathogens in humans are, are not that uh, easy to carry out. At the same time, uh, study of viral pathogens in mice, uh, that might not be relevant, because mice might not be a uh, natural host for that particular virus. So that's why I've been studying for a number of years uh, um, um, large, uh, large animal models because, um, and viruses that cause diseases in these, uh, in uh, sheep and in, in, in particular in, uh, in small ruminants. So these are naturally, we can look at naturally occurring diseases and make these observations, then we can uh, try to uh, study some of these characteristics in, in vitro. But then the sort of the, the, the attract the traction of this system is that we can use then the same uh, host to in as a um, in an experimental setting. So we, we, we basically what we have a ship is both a naturally host of the disease, but it's also uh, um, would be susceptible to um, we can use it in in a in a convenient experimental setting, and uh, and that's today. Then I'll I'll, I'll focus on this system. Uh, looking at uh, blue dong, so blue dong is, is one of the major infectious diseases of uh, of, um, of, of ruminants, and uh, it's uh, caused by uh, blue dong virus, which is an, is a um, it's a um, an orbivirus is within the same family of uh, uh, of, uh, of rotaviruses, and uh, it's an RNA double stranded RNA segmented virus, and is uh, is transmitted by Coligode species, or is a, is an arbovirus uh, transmitted by the, the budding midges. There are in, in nature a variety of serotypes, uh, 27, 28 at the last count. Every every year there is uh, another uh, couple that uh, um, that uh, come up. Um, the, the, this was like um, many uh, arbovirus diseases, it was historically confined to the tropical and subtropical areas of the globe. But we uh, never had, uh, um, actually, we had maybe a couple of uh, outbreaks uh, before the uh, 19. Uh, before 1998, uh, the, there'd been only uh, an, uh, an outbreak in Cyprus and another one in, in Spain um, in the 60s or 56, 1956. Uh, never had, uh, when I had uh, blue dong in Europe. And then in uh, 1998, a uh, few incursion had uh, started to occur. Um, numbers are not really that important, with the exception that you see, you see BTV 1, 4, 9, 16, so a variety of viruses started to enter and became endemic in uh, southern Europe, so uh, up to, uh, they arrived up to, up to um, France. So this is up to 2005, then in 2006, um, almost unthinkable did happen with that uh, um, um, these arbovirus started to enter northern Europe. Uh, BTV8 was the cause of uh, the biggest outbreak of blue dong in history with uh, a couple of uh, millions of sheep uh, that had been uh, uh, killed as a result of BTV infection. Uh, the virus also entered in Scandinavia. Uh, one of my PhD students prepared this, uh, this graph. Uh, to be, uh, she's been a little bit over enthusiastic because in Sweden only one ship had been uh, diagnosed with, uh, <laughs> with BTV, so maybe that's, uh, you have to take it with a little bit of pinch of salt, but certainly did enter in, the, in Northern Europe, uh, including, uh, including the UK. So then uh, 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 the vaccination campaign uh, started, so we g got rid of uh, BTV8. Uh, uh, um, in, in the wherever the vaccine has been used. 
Um, then uh, bugs in usage started to go down, and in 2015 we had uh, um, uh, other um, um, the reemergence of BTV8 uh, that has continued in 2016. So really, that just to give you an idea that uh, now blue dong is endemic in uh, Europe. There, is a, there are a variety of, uh, of viruses. I will not talk to you about this work, but uh, what also we've shown uh, helping uh, colleagues in Perbright and, uh, and others in Glasgow is that this virus is a segmented virus. And uh, what you see here is, the, is, a, is a, um, a radial uh, tree which, um, which all the different segments. And you see these all different colors. What it actually means is that basically as soon as you have different viruses coming in, they will all resort. And that is one of the major drivers of uh, evolution of this, uh, of this uh, virus. So um, the, 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 the really the key question that I wanted to address uh, a few years ago when I started to work in this field was, uh, um, was the fact that uh, um, the, the all ruminants are susceptible to infection, uh, but only sheep really get sick. <coughs> And even within sheep, some animals, uh, they just get a little hemorrhagic fever, so they actually will die as a result of our infection, where, where others have only a mild uh, uh, fever, so or, or even just uh, very minimal uh, clinical signs. Cows are considered to be the major reservoirs of infection, so they do get infected, they get high level of varemia, but uh, they uh, do not uh, um, very rarely cause, uh, get uh, clinical symptoms, uh, and uh, similarly, the goats are not um, um, as well, they do not get, uh, get sick. Um, and as I say, so cows are considered reservoirs uh, also because of the body size, so you actually get many more midges feeding on, uh, on, uh, on a cow than, uh, than on a sheep. Um, so th really what we wanted to do was what to, to, to study what factors determine this, uh, uh, this variability. And uh, so to me the system is very attractive because in essence you have uh, different uh, hosts, they're all, all susceptible to infection but different uh, clinical outcomes. You have a variety of, uh, of viruses so which with different serotype, different strains, uh, different uh, resortants and the midges that transmit, uh, transmit the virus. And, it, and therefore, even if we actually talk about blue dong virus and, and the blue tongue as the disease, you really have a variety of viruses causing a variety of clinical syndromes. And, uh, and, and this is with some, diff with some sort of variation is really what we see also in, in, in most viral diseases. So it's a fundamental um, uh, question of trying to understand what is that determines this interaction. So that's the approach that I'm going to talk to you is really, first I'll show you a little bit the experimental platform of, of how we do, we carry out these experiments. I will not have the time to look actually, uh, to talk to you about the, the identifying the determinants of BTV uh, uh, virulence. So I can look at which are problems more Im important than others. And, uh, and then I'll show you how we look at explore some sites of viral replication, then how we link them to pathogenesis on sort of papers that we published recently. And then we'll show you some, some data that uh, we haven't uh, published yet, but they are, uh, we think, very uh, important to understand virus host interaction. So now first let me just uh, show you a little bit how we normally do uh, um, do this, carry out this, this experiment. So the, the, the experimental infection with BTV has been c carried out for, uh, for decades. But the problem, especially when you go, uh, uh, this sort of about five years that I started to, wor to work with this virus, is that when you look at the literature, you have, uh, um, it's very, they're very difficult to compare one study with the other one because the different viruses are used, uh, different uh, strains, different serotypes, different ship uh, uh, breeds um, in different, uh, different conditions. So we, we started, first of all, to uh, try to uh, carry out a series of experiments in vivo where we kept all the same uh, uh, the same viruses, uh, same road inoculations, which, by the way, are intradermal in the vicinity of uh, uh, prescapular and the inguinal lymph nodes in different sites. Um, and, and again, so all in the same time. And here, just to show you, for example, an example. So in blue, these are goats, and then here are different breeds of sheep. And, um, and how we um, uh, assess the, cl the clinical signs is really for a veterinarian to inspect the animals without knowing what 
virus has been uh, has been uh, um, uh, inoculated, and then uh, um, to sort of assess this clinical score, which is done is done in several ways, where you give points to a variety to different clinical symptoms. And here, just to show you, the sort of you have sheep that all are susceptible, so you have clinical signs. Well, instead, goats in this blue, you really have no clinical signs at all. Uh, this is the f fever as well, so you have fever, uh, a peak of fever on se day seven after infection. You see no fever in, uh, in goats, but you see you, you have varemia, so you still have a peak of varemia. Uh, normally, there is a little bit of delay, but uh, goats have uh, a, a high level of varemia as much as sheep. Now, one observation that now I'm going to show you for a little bit in different systems that then they also have higher level of neutralizing antibodies at the early times post-infection. So the goats, they don't get sick, higher level neutralizing antibody. Now, this is just another experiment. Now, here we look at the same virus, but isolated at the beginning of the outbreak in, in the uh, Northern Europe in 2006 versus a strain that was towards the end in 2008, 2009, actually it was an Italian strain. And, uh, uh, we had reason to believe from the field observation that this strain was actually less virulent. So we repeat the same thing. And here, really, what you have, so this is BTV8. This is BTV2, is another virus that uh, isolated in Italy in 2000. And here, what you actually see is that the BTV in, isolated in red, that one isolated at the end of the uh, outbreak, is less, causes less fever, has got less clinical signs. But again, you have varemia. Uh, as the other viruses. And here you have higher, uh, again, uh, not much different, but it's always, uh, we've always seen it, higher level of, uh, of uh, neutralizing antibodies at day seven post-infection. And this is an, another system where I, I, I won't have the time to go into it, but what we actually, different people have observed, that if you inject the virus directly from uh, blood, so you just take the virus from uh, a viremic, viremic ship uh, that has been uh, um, naturally infected, take the blood, infect the animal. That uh, is much, the virus is much more virulent than if you take the virus and you pass in culture and then go back into the animal. And this is again is the same thing, so the, the virus, just the blood is in blue, so higher fever, more signs, a little bit of varemia. But what you see, actually, is that the virus that instead is less virulent, you have higher level, again, of neutralized antibody compared to the blood. In this case, we can't actually detect uh, neutralizing antibodies at all. So just to summarize, what we saw in our experiments, others as well have, uh, have uh, observed the same thing, and uh, is that at the early stage after infection, a virus that sheep infected with an attenuated so sort of less virulent uh, uh, strain have higher level of neutralizing antibodies compared to sheep that are infected with more virulent strains. So that's uh, we thought sort of we, we saw in different systems. So that was a, we, uh, a key uh, observation. So really, what we wanted to look at, we wanted to uh, look how the virus interferes with the immune response of the host in the early few days after infection. There had to be something, and uh, that's uh, uh, that was a given and uh, how this process was related to uh, clinical outcome of infection. And uh, uh, this is Eleonora Melzi, who's a PhD student who really carried out most of, this, of, the, of the work. Um, and uh, she just uh, graduated, and now she's uh, moving next month to Harvard for, to do a, a postdoc uh, there. Uh, Marco Caporale is, a, is a, someone who's worked with me, a, a, a postdoctoral and a veterinary virologist as well. And he's a hero because he's most of the animal experiments have been carried out by him. This is an uh, animal experiment uh, in CL3, so for sheep, so there's a lot of logistic uh, uh, challenges. And uh, Noemi Sevilla is, a, is an immunologist from Madrid. That she did the last part of the study that I'm going to, uh, to, um, to, to show you. So this sort of experimental plan, it didn't quite start uh, with this plan. As we all know in science, you, have, you, you plant something and then you go back and you replant it. Uh, but basically, we had a stock. We normally, when we start these things, we prepare virus stocks that we have and we aliquot and keep in the freezer. So we had anticipated to do only uh, three time points, but then it turned out that we needed to do more, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment uh, why. Uh, animals infected intradermally in the vicinity of the inguinal and prescabular lymph nodes with 
wild type BTB8 or with an attenuated strain. So now I'm going to focus only with a wild type, uh, wild type virus. And uh, this is the first thing, just to give you an idea. So these are different tissues starting from the skin and we look just at the RNA level across the body and really that's what you actually see is that so of course the virus is in the skin you find the all throughout the duration of the experiment is finished at day seven so we knew at day seven that's where there was already uh, the key event happening of, uh, of, uh, um, of this difference in the early um, uh, level the early um, level of neutralizing antibodies and uh, the virus in, in the blood really sort of start at day two, day three, but you, you pick uh, around day seven. And the virus in the periphery, of course, as soon as you start to find in the blood, then it's where you, you just find it more and more into, into the periphery um, as well. Um, now, the, the, of course, in the actions, I, I'm not an I'm not immunologist, but I was sort of forced to try to understand some of the key um, um, uh, key events. Now the, all the action uh, for uh, um, antibody response happens in secondary lymphoid tissues and as you know sort of the, the, so there's a schematic of, uh, um, of a, um, a, a, a lymph node. So you have the afferent lymph, so antigens that will be drained from the skin will have to go throughout the afferent lymph, either free uh, or through uh, carried by, uh, by cells. Um, and then this is the subcapsular lymph node, and, uh, and therefore, so genes, um, antigens that are certain size, like viruses, um, will have to be either uh, get, so they will not be able to pass this subcapsular sinus, but will have to be carried out by uh, macrophages, um, so picked up by macrophages, and then uh, we're going into the uh, follicle areas where you have B cells, that's the paragolic areas that you have T cells, and these are the hindotelial venules where the cells from the lymphocyte from the blood uh, arrive. Um, so what we actually see is that in this case, again, the virus is, uh, is inoculated intradermally, and this is an immune histochemistry, and that just to give you a sort of the idea of the time, and this is the brown spots, is the immune histochemistry for the virus. So at the beginning, you will see them in, in the, the sucrapsular sinuses. And then as the time <coughs> progresses, we see mainly really in the follicle, so in the B cell area. And uh, they seem to be clean, uh, cleared by day, in day seven, uh, um, with the exception of a few sites in the, in mainly in the, uh, medulla, um, in the medulla. Uh, now, so this is the draining lymph node. If we look at distant lymph nodes, so in, for example, the mediastinal lymph nodes, um, we actually don't find the virus until day five, day seven. And again, by here, we find it only in the mediastinal lymph node. And this is really sort of a different pattern because in the draining lymph node, the virus gets through the, through the lymph, while in, uh, um, uh, in, in these distant lymph nodes, we'll get through the, uh, through the blood. Um, so th th now the next, the next question really, which are the cells that are infected by BTB in the lymph node? And this is a, is a ship lymph node. So this is now the, the ship uh, um, or prescapular lymph node is sort of something of this size. And, and what you see here is, are just images is that are tiled from, uh, from a microscope and from a, a confocal microscopy and uh, uh, reconstructed. And so this is a, a day, um, uh, day one, so 24 hours post-infection where you, you see all the, um, uh, so this is BTB and S2, you see all into sort of the subcapsular sinuses. And uh, we found uh, mainly three different types of cells. So these subcapsular macrophages, uh, these sinus lin line, lining cells, these are the endothelial cells. I forgot to actually mention an important point, that the virus really um, causes hemorrhagic fever because it's really endotheliotropic. So in the skin, we find it mainly in the endothelial cells. At the early time points in the endothelial cells, so the lymphatic uh, venules, and the late time points instead in the in sort of the, the capillaries, and so in the more in the blood uh, vessel. So in the sinus lining cells, and then there is also these, uh, um, these uh, uh, conduits that, uh, um, that uh, uh, basically um, connect uh, the subcapsular sinus to, uh, to the parenchyma of the lymph node. And also we found in some of these foliar B cells, not much, but uh, we found in some uh, foliar B cells. Now, um, this is just uh, one of the conduits um, that I showed you before. 
Um, and, and that's what, what you actually see is that the virus infected cells uh, are in, uh, the virus is in green, so you see the virus in the, uh, in the sun line cells. And these are, are really their conduits. So when you saw in, in, the, in the 2D picture, it seemed to be just a very long cell. But in reality, is, uh, it, it's like a, uh, every time I just get seasick when I see this thing. Uh, but just to give you an idea, they really sort of these are, 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 uh, are conduits. Okay, I'm just going to stop this. Um, so now, uh, something that is, is important is a very nice paper um, uh, by Fegundo Batista um, that was in London, now moved to Harvard, showing that these subcapsular sinus macrophages are sort of the guardian of the lymph nodes, so where they actually have pathogen invading uh, the, um, the lymph node, these are really the cells that are critical to block this invasion. Now, what is very interesting is that in sheep, we can find this layer of subcapsular sinus macrophages. So we found these macrophages, but um, they're, they're mainly uh, near the trabeculates, and also they are, they are patchy. Their presence is, uh, is patchy. Now, the, my PhD student, I moved to, moved to uh, Harvard and uh, moved to the laboratory of Fegundo Batista, who's, uh, who, who made this discovery. And so the first question he asked her was, so what about the subcapsular sinus macrophage? She was terrorized, too. And then uh, she said, no, no, relax. Just tell me what you think. And she said, I think that it's only in mice. And uh, that's where it is a, is, a, is a phenotype that exists only in mice. Now, they think that also in humans they do exist. But certainly in sheep, they're not, uh, they don't have this uh, structure. This is another reason why, actually, we do need to have experiments not only done in, in mouse and in, in mice and in, in humans, but also in different animal species. So in the follicles, then uh, uh, the virus infected, we found uh, two different types. So we say the B cells, but also cells with dendritic morphology that then we, and this is actually another way to, to show you um, uh, better, and these very important cells for uh, um, for uh, um, the antibody response, and these are the follicular dendritic cells, and you see sort of in red, so these are the, the, they form sort of a mesh uh, within uh, within the the, um, uh, the B cell area. Now, the, this this is the, uh, the uh, you can characterize the phenotype with different uh, different markers. And uh, so here in this picture, you see the uh, CD83 is one of them. Uh, BTV sort of is red, CD3 in green. I need to write it because I'm color blind. So uh, all this confocal microscopy is always a challenge for me. And the uh, smooth muscle act acting is outside sort of what's defined in the, um, uh, the follicle. Now, we, so we not only saw that uh, the virus was infecting foliodendry cells, but actually were destroying foliodendry cells very effectively. And one of the reasons that we had to go back and do more experiments was because at the beginning, um, uh, Eleonora was really confused because she said, I can't find foliodendritic cells. In, uh, I find them in the controls, but I can't find them in the, in the infected uh, animals. So we had to go back and, uh, and to actually the point of finding the virus uh, when it was uh, uh, in the cells was very difficult. When instead, you could f easily see the destruction of these foliodendritic cells. And so that really uh, suggesting that the virus, uh, well, suggesting the virus is infecting them and is, uh, is killing uh, these cells. So here, sort of, you see these uh, holes in, uh, um, in, in where the foliodendritic cells uh, should be. Um, and this just to give you an example, this is something that a colleague in Sardinia has done. We have two different viruses. One is a highly pathogenic, a BTV1, isolated in 2006, and create a lot of problems to the sheep uh, uh, farming in, uh, in, uh, in Sardinia. While instead, a BTV1 in 2013 didn't cause much. This is just a pilot experiment that we had to do more. And we look at sort of day five in line with, other, with, other, with our experiment. You don't see for Leo and Reed cells. They're all sort of gone, and very little virus. Uh, hanging around. And when instead in BTV1 2013, you actually see the virus uh, again in the, in the foliodendritic cells. So in this case, so these anatinated virus are still targeting foliodendritic cells, but the, the, the actual uh, time that seemed to be there is much longer. So we need to do more experiment now to, to understand this. But now, the, the foliodendritic cells are critical cells. So first of all, they, 
they contribute to the structural organization of the follicle. So they, they contribute to the structural organization of the follicle because they express um, um, uh, chemokines um, uh, that are then uh, that attract um, attract B cells. So the, 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 they're, they're in essence the reason of why there are B cell area because they express then receptor. Uh, for uh, um, for B cells, so that they do, they will express chemokines for uh, for B cells, and then they physically will interact with uh, for the and D cells. Now, of course, this is um, what well, um, are also essential for B cell maturation. So, the process of uh, affinity maturation of B cells that, that will uh, um, uh, increasingly um, 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 be selected, the one that have a higher avidity for the antigen, is also facilitated by FTCs. And just to remind you that these foliar dendritic cells are, are, have a mesenchymal origin, so they have nothing to do with the actual with the dendritic cells in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, with the classic dendritic cells uh, or with the uh, plasma acidoid uh, dendritic cells. But really, so that's the, 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 the process where you have a T cell antigen and a B cell maturation and the affinity maturation of B cells. And really, then from these B cells, you really come up out of the lymph node, you have either memory B cells or plasma cells that will. Uh, uh, secrete uh, antibodies, and this process is, uh, is um, uh, FTCs are are, uh, are key for this process. In fact, one of the things that in mice that were were uh, have been looked um, uh, to grow T cells and they, they they have bladed the FTCs is that the structure of the germinal center is lost, and the structure is lost um, as because sort of these B cells are not kept in place uh, anymore, they are not as attracted anymore. And here what we actually see, so these are the control, you see these uh, very nice uh, 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 germinal centers, where instead here in uh, BTV day one and day three, you see how the sort of the germinal center tend to these B cells and to be more uh, uh, dispersed. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to actually um, uh, show you is that as a result of, uh, of uh, a BTV infection, the B cells, they actually, these are, are dividing in the germinal cells. They are called uh, centroblasts. Uh, they stop actually dividing. And so what you actually see, so if we look at the, here the stain for KI67, and you normally you, you, you will see the germinal center characterized by the presence of these KI, uh, KI67 positive B cells. They are lost in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, BTV infected uh, uh, center. Here what you actually tend to see is that at the very early time points where you have uh, um, uh, very little uh, virus or more progressively more virus and you start to lose progressively the stain for ki 6 7 In this case here is in what you need to look is, is purple. So um, it was clear therefore that uh, the virus was infecting FDC, was destroying FDC and seems therefore to also affect the function of, uh, of FDC but also B cells because there were no B cells uh, um, uh, division. Um, so w we now look and try to determine if this uh, infection affects uh, BTV, um, uh, the mere response to, um, to BTV. And here we have two groups. So we have a, a group inoculated with an uh, attenuated virus. This is BTV P65. This is just a, a virus that's been passed 65 times in, in culture. And what you have, you infect cells, uh, will induce neutralizing antibodies, but there is no varemia. So that's the, the varemia here. Um, one said that this uh, group of cells infected with the wild type, and, and of course you do have varemia. And what we actually noticed, similar to what we noticed with the, with the Sardinian virus, is that the virus still infected FDC. However, um, uh, it recovered much early. So this is uh, B cells, B cells in uh, control animals, animals uh, infected with an attenuated virus, or animals infected with wild type virus. You see in the control, these are B cells, KI67 positive. Day seven, this is attenuated virus, so this is start to recover. While instead in the wild type, you see the, the follicle the, the start to sort of lose a little bit their structure, and there are no K67 or very few K67 positive cells. So there is some sort of to be a, a recovery of the germinal center much, much faster. Now, the other thing that we notice then, so we look at neutralizing antibodies, and similar to other experimental settings here, what you have at day seven, 
the animals infected with attenuated virus have a higher level of neutralizing antibodies compared to the wild type virus. So this is really in line with different, a variety of different experiments we did in the past. Whatever is sort of more attenuated, higher neutralizing antibodies at day seven. Then you start to, to basically have the same level. But then what we actually look, we also look at the avidity. So these, the, the antibodies, against the antibody, uh, against the attenuated virus are higher avidity compared to, so sort of better quality compared to the ones, um, to those produced by sheep uh, infected with wild type. So really what it looks like is that does actually the virus induce a transitory immunosuppression because that's what, uh, uh, what it seems to have. So by interfering with the, with the cap capability of the host to mount a, a high quality antibody response early time after, after infection. And in order sort of to, to um, r uh, answer this question, we, um, we um, look in collaboration with Noemi in, uh, in Madrid um, we looked for a uh, human immune response of sheep against a T cell dependent antigen that is uh, um, ovalbumin. So you have ovalbumin, so sheep, one group of sheep were immunized with ovalbumin, and then we uh, look at uh, um, uh, the, uh, their antibody responses of 7, 14, and 20 days post infection. And then we had our other two groups of sheep like this, they were immunized with uh, ovalbumin, but they were infected with BTV one day or three days before, um, before the immunization. So same, same immunization, but one group non-infected, another two groups infected uh, uh, earlier on. And then we look at antibodies against ovalbumin. So here we, won't look, we don't look at antibodies against BTV, but only against uh, ovalbumin. And so what we actually see is really e also against ovalbumin, the animals have been infected with BTV here in this case. One day before, uh, we found uh, basically no antibody, very little antibodies against ovalbumin as opposed to the, to the control. Um, sorry, these are not, uh, these are not antibodies, these are early spots. So looking at um, um, antibody secreting cells, so the essential the plasma cells against the ovalbumin. Uh, and similar results, basically, is the levels and the avidity of antibody against of albumin. Again, we found the same uh, uh, similar results, uh, basically, with a higher level in the animals uh, uh, that they were uh, vaccinated compared to the ones that were infected uh, before. So let me just uh, give you the key conclusion of what I wanted to tell you. It's that the force sort of BTV reaches the draining lymph node uh, in experiment infected sheep very early after uh, after infection through the lymph, too short for cells to, to transport the virus. Uh, here in the lymph nodes, BTV infects and destroys FDCs and therefore induces a block on the, prolifer on the proliferation of uh, B cells in the germinal center and therefore induces a transient immunosuppression. And then the levels of destruction of FDCs are correlated with the level of virus induced pathological lesion because this is really is directly correlated to the spread of the virus in secondary organs, in the lungs, in spleen, in, in, uh, uh, in the mucosal surfaces, and that's what actually why the animal gets sick, is when the virus replicates in the, in the periphery. So that's the whole key, is having this varivia in the presence of high quality or low quality antibodies, is that the virus will be able to spread more or less uh, uh, efficiently. And I want just to uh, thank mostly Eleonora and Marco that really have driven this uh, um, this uh, this research, um, the whole experiments that I that I showed you, and uh, 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 Noemi for the uh, work on uh, um, on um, ovalbumin. And I'll I'll stop here. If you if you have any questions, I'll be happy to to answer. Thank you. Thank you.